There is nothing more tantalizing to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies, and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Google Earth user spots a 400-foot ice ship off the coast of Antarctica. Google Earth is a fantastic tool that almost everyone has played around with at some point, but one particular user of the app found what they claim to be a 400-foot ice ship trapped in an iceberg about 100 miles off the coast of the freezing continent. The impressive ice formation is said to have an uncanny similarity to a cruise ship, with lines of windows and hosts of chimneys. Immediately after the Google Earth user posted their findings, the discovery blew up online in conspiracy circles, with all sorts of theories arising as to what the large glacial object could be and how it got there. Many of those involved with the theorizing declared their belief that there is something either stuck or secretly hidden away from our sight in the continent. Certain theorists suggested things ranging from it being a secluded 1940s bunker to some long-gone civilization which, for one reason or another, disappeared. YouTube user Mr. MBB333 was the first to share the images on the platform and is a self-proclaimed Earth Watchman. Furthermore, he has allegedly been using Google Earth for the entire past decade, observing the globe, its reactions to space weather, and how the Earth's inner mechanics work. Mr. MBB333 claims to monitor the entire Earth, from seabed to the mountains to space and everything around us. The video in question reveals a huge block of ice amongst a snowy white background from the basic view, but when he switches to an in-depth 3D screen, the block of ice transforms, forming the shape of a ship which he measured out in estimates to be 4,000 feet in length. It looks like a random iceberg to the onlooker, but part of it looks like it's built with purpose, like an entryway. It does not look random, as if it had a purpose. He states also pointing out the symmetrical features which he believes must have been created, not naturally formed as certain aspects of it have crisp 90 degree angles. The video has more than 46,000 views and sparked a heavy conversation down in the comments section regarding the phenomenon. Someone in the comments claimed that it is likely something that remained from the Arctic explorations. Another commenter argued that it must be a vehicle of sorts, hidden under the ice and concealed from common sight as a bunker for the elite should a global catastrophe occur. A particular user believes that the wealthy have been going out there for about 80 years and refuse to tell the public of its existence. Until now. Another person stated that they believe that ships are built underground, also to save the powerful elite 1% population like in the movie 2012. Many viewers of the video felt rage at the thought of astronauts, politicians, religious leaders and the rich having an elusive escape plan should a world-shattering disaster take out the majority of the common population. The most common theory though was that more investigations should be done on the continent, as there might have been a secret never before known about civilization. One other person commented, much more attention needs to be given to this continent. It wasn't always frozen. Whether there is any real truth to the claims, or whether any of these theories are true, we cannot know for certain. Speculation is the best we can do until more research or investigation is done into the matter. The Accounts of the Sea People Though there were many ancient civilizations that had existed during the 12th century BC, suddenly and quite unexpectedly nearly every civilization was wiped from the face of the earth except the cities of Egypt. This phenomenon was recorded as the Late Bronze Age collapse that soon bled into the early Greek Dark Ages as only small villages of humanity survived this sudden catastrophe. For many decades, the cause of such an occurrence had widely been unknown and shrouded in mystery. That was until the ancient language of the Egyptian hieroglyphics 
had been decoded and allowed us to read the historical records captured at the time by the last standing ancient civilization. This record has led to countless theories and endless debate amongst Egyptologists, classic historians and archaeologists since its findings. Reportedly, by the historical accounts of the ancient Egyptians, armies of what had been referred to at the time as Sea People attacked and demolished the cities of man. In fact, the descriptions of the armies of the Sea People describe monsters and giants coming from the oceans and waging war against all of civilization. The reasoning for why this sudden onslaught had occurred has yet to be better understood. But what is all the more surprising is the vast conspiracy surrounding the events. Accounts continue of the Egyptians attempting to track the source of the beasts that appeared humanoid in nature and found hundreds of footprints leaving and coming from the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea. Today, after uncovering vast art depicting the battles, documents detailing the events, and further evidence of war and tactics used against the destroyed and forgotten civilizations of the past, the proof of the account of the Sea People appears to be overwhelming in nature. As a matter of fact, the events are so overwhelming that the discussion surrounding the event in the scientific community has been completely shut down and further theories or attempts at uncovering the truth are treated with both disdain and ridicule. Regardless of this ridicule, however, many researchers continue to attempt to understand the mysteries of the Sea People and remain restless in their pursuits. Perhaps one day we will better understand whether these accounts are of mythology or true history. Until then, the accounts of the Sea People are shrouded in creepy events and terrifying mysteries. A Discovered 1.8 Billion Year Old Nuclear Reactor Back in 1972, when a large amount of uranium ore was mined from the Oklo mine located out in the country of Gabron, a small nation found in Central Africa, Scientists began to test the uranium deposits to catalogue the amount of recovered uranium-235 that was gathered from the site and could be used for ongoing efforts of nuclear fission and nuclear reactors. Unfortunately, they quickly realised that a substantial amount of uranium-235 was missing from the ore deposits as uranium-235 naturally forms a solid concentration of 0.072%, but found a significant amount lacking from the mined minerals. As they investigated the situation, Believing that perhaps more than 200 kilograms had been stolen, they quickly realised that located near the mined location was the perfect conditions to form a believed to be naturally forming nuclear reactor that is dated to be roughly 1.8 billion years old. Scientists claimed that the uranium ore was used up when a naturally formed cavern using groundwater to help stabilise the nuclear reaction was discovered underground. Theorists, however, have an alternative explanation. Given the fact that the specifications required to form a naturally made nuclear reactor require specific storage of the uranium-235, the continued influx of water and a number of steps to prevent the compounds from becoming superheated, it is believed that the location is not naturally formed and rather the use of a primitive nuclear reactor by time-travelling humans needed to create a substantial amount of energy. Today, the claim is widely debated as one of the key pieces of evidence of time-travelling humans and their influence on the past. The Magical Abilities of the Bosnian Pyramids The Earth might be tiny compared to other planets, but it for sure has a lot of variety. One mysterious structure that has caused many to ask questions is that of the Pyramids of Bosnia. The Pyramids of Giza are truly impressive, but the giant Pyramids of Bosnia are just as impressive. One of the local archaeologists in Bosnia made a claim related to the Bosnian pyramids. He believes they are at least 30,000 years old, which is 20,000 years earlier than what our history taught us. The Bosnian pyramids are a massive complex of five different pyramids. The entire complex can be found near a small town, 30 kilometers northwest of Sarajevo in Bosnia. Some of the scientists refuse to even look at them and they claim that the archaeologist is just trying to secure funding and get more tourists in Bosnia. Of course, not all of the scientists refuse to know more. Organic fossils have been found inside the chambers that have been excavated. The find suggests that the pyramids are approximately 30,000 years old. This is surprising considering we have been taught that the ancient structures were not nearly as old as this. 
Just like the Egyptian pyramids, the pyramids of Bosnia also orient to the cosmic north. What makes the pyramids of Bosnia so special is the fact they are 15 times more accurate than the Pyramid of Giza. The top of each pyramid, dragon, sun and moon, also forms a flawlessly perfect equilateral triangle. Another interesting discovery is that researchers have detected and measured an energy beam that gets released from the top of the Bosnian pyramid. What surprised the researchers is that when the distances increase, the energy beam does not become weaker. Incredibly, it actually becomes stronger and more intense. Tests have been carried out and it was reported that the energy beam has a diameter of between 5 and 9 meters. Some archaeologists have called the pyramid an energy machine. The underground chambers of the pyramids seem to feature ionization levels that are much higher than the outside. Some even suggest that the pyramid and the energy it gives off have different healing properties. Ashima Island, Japan Gonkanjima, meaning Battle Island, officially named Hashima Island or simply known as Hashima, is an island off Nagasaki, long since isolated and abandoned, but no means the only abandoned Japanese island. Hashima Island is one of 505 uninhabited Nagasaki Islands. The architecture of Hashimi is composed primarily of concrete buildings, inhabited now only by nature. This island is both considered a symbol and milestone in the extraordinary industrialization of Japan, in modern buildings and architectural advancements. But Hashima's existence also serves as a grim symbol of past war crimes committed by the Japanese during the Second World War, primarily the now controversial belief that the island was used as a center for forced labor by prisoners of war. The island stretches 16 acres and was considered renowned for the undersea coal mines which were built in 1887, operating during the industrialization of Japan. The peak of the island's population was in 1957, with 5,259 citizens, when the island's coal industry was still afloat. By the 1970s, however, all the coal had been nearly depleted, and soon thereafter the mines were shut down, with the residents quickly leaving. The island was all but forgotten until the 2000s, when interest in the mysterious Gunkanjima rose. This time, it was its dark past that attracted people, alongside with the disturbed pieces of war history that occupy the island. Slowly, it became a tourist attraction, with some exterior walls restored for the sake of tourism. Officially, the island was opened for tourism on April 22nd of 2009. Tourism helped renew a desire for the conservation of the historic island, with the coal mine approved as a World Heritage Site in 2015. The coal mine of Hashima is considered one of Japan's Meiji Industrial Revolution sites. The island's nickname, Gunkajima, comes from Gunkan, the word for warship, and Jima, a form of the word Shima, meaning island. The direct translation is Warship Island later transliterated as Battleship Island in English. The reasoning behind this strange nickname actually has little to do with its military past, but more so with how the island looks. Its shape resembles the Japanese battleship known as Tosa. Coal is a huge part of the island's history, with the first coal being found in 1810. From then, the island had continuous citizens upon it, many of whom worked as miners and extracted the coal working and living on it. In 1890, during the island's best economic booms, Mitsubishi Goshi Kaisha purchased it for the sake of extracting more coal from the undersea mines. During this time, the seawalls and artificial man-made land reclamation projects tripled the overall size of the island to allow for more workers and inhabitants. An estimated 15.7 million tons of coal were taken from the island before its resources ceased. The first concrete building was placed in 1916 and was a seven-floor apartment block meant to house miners and other workers. The concrete allowed protection against typhoons. In the 55 years that followed, countless more buildings were placed on the island, including several more apartment blocks, a school, public baths, a swimming pool, community centre, hospital and even a town hall. The island took on a life of its own once only meant for workers and now bustling with families and a small, dedicated community. 
after the start of the Second World War in the late 1930s, forcibly conscripted Korean civilians were forced to undergo heavy labor on the island alongside Chinese prisoners of war. The conditions were said to be horrific, with brutal punishments for those who tried to rebel or failed to accomplish the difficult tasks given to them. It's believed that at least 1,300 unwilling laborers perished under these work conditions on Hashima Island due to the plethora of reasons from sheer physical exhaustion to underground accidents that come with the trade of heavy labor. Malnourishment was said to be common for the conscripted laborers and the prisoners of war. It's crucial to add that in our contemporary time, many Japanese and South Korean scholars considered this to be a false theory and deny that any such thing ever occurred. Indeed, the records are unproven, and it is important to present both sides of the theory and argument. Lee Yu Yeon, an author of the novel Anti-Japan Tribalism, states that a vast amount of records were corrupted or edited and facts distorted over the course of time, especially regarding the issue of Korean conscription. Whether or not this happened remains debated. Oliver Cromwell Oliver Cromwell went down in history as a military and political figure who freed England from the authoritarian Charles I. He was given the high honour of being the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland. However, this is not his only legacy. While the English praised him for his great bravery, he was despised by the Irish who believed he was a king-slaying religious maniac. Let's dive deeper into this mysterious historical icon who, until this day, is believed to be the man who made a pact with the devil. In 1599, Oliver Cromwell was born to a wealthy family in Huntingdon, England. He grew up to be such a statesman and a respected member of the community that later on, he became part of the Parliament for Huntingdon in 1628. With regard to his family life, at 21 years old, he married Elizabeth Cromwell, who was a daughter of a businessman. They had nine children together. Although little is known about his early life, he was described as an intensely religious man who believed that God is guiding his victories. He was known to be tolerant, if not a supporter of the Protestant faith. However, he hated the Catholics and they hated him back. Oliver Cromwell has committed extreme measures as a militarist, which many considered as genocidal. He was, and still is, widely criticized for such acts, especially in Ireland. After having slain King Charles I, not everyone was pleased with Oliver Cromwell. The Scottish people saw him as a mass murderer of men, women, and even children, and they strongly believed that he needed to be stopped at all costs. They wanted Charles II to take his place. It was a war between parliamentarians and royalists. In history books, this is known as the Battle of Worcester. After months of fighting against the underdog forces of Charles I, Oliver Cromwell knew that he was going to win the war. He had a significantly bigger army of men to fight for him. At this point, the royalists can only die or surrender to him. It was on September the 3rd, 1651, when the mystifying thing happened. Oliver Cromwell was in a camp in Perry Wood, a secluded area deep in the vast Feckenham Forest. He, together with his captain of his own regiment, Colonel Lindsay, were taken to the woods to meet a mysterious elderly man holding a roll of parchment in his hands. Allegedly, this old man offered Cromwell to have whatever he wants for the next seven years, and after that, he, the devil, will have complete mastery over his body and soul. According to the alleged account of Colonel Lindsay, Cromwell argued with the devil and demanded 21 years instead of only seven. After this, Cromwell happily screamed and celebrated because now the battle is in his hands. Soon after that encounter, the Battle of Worcester ended with thousands of men and horses killed and a lot more captured as prisoners. Cromwell has greatly won. However, his victory was not for long. Exactly seven years after his alleged deal with the devil, he passed away due to multiple severe illnesses attributed to malaria and kidney stones at the age of 59. In 1659, Cromwell's son Richard, who was also his successor, surrendered to Charles II less than a year after his death. This is known in history as the Restoration. Fueled by vengeance, the new king ordered that the body of Cromwell be removed from his grave and be executed despite already being dead. Cromwell was hanged and beheaded in public and his head was placed on a spike above Westminster Hall. 
The question of whether or not Oliver Cromwell's deal with the devil was for real is still left unanswered and continues to be a mystery more than three centuries after his death. The Devil's Rocking Chair Incident In 2019, Zach Baggins introduced a rocking chair, which he had acquired from the Museum of Ed and Lorraine Warren into his haunted museum in Las Vegas. The chair, known as the Devil's Rocking Chair, which was the inspiration behind the third installment in the smash horror hit franchise The Conjuring. However, Baggins decided to close the exhibit after realizing that the chair was seemingly behind a number of strange goings on both in the museum and in his own home. In one incident, six visitors to his museum had experienced the same uncontrollable crying whilst in the vicinity of the chair, and one guest had even collapsed on the stairs above the place where the chair was situated. According to Baggins, the paranormal activity didn't stop there. During a visit by a friend to Baggins' Las Vegas home, the pair began to experience a strange evil aura between them causing Baggins' dog to start growling and Baggins himself to fall into a possessed rant, uttering strange words about God and Satan. His friend then began to experience the same uncontrollable crying before running out of the house. The chair itself has a dark history and a large price tag, with Baggins reportedly paying around $67,000 for it. He mentioned that the chair inspired the third Conjuring film, The Devil Made Me Do It, well, the film's title takes its name from a true story. In the 1980s, an 11-year-old boy named David Glatzel had allegedly been possessed by a demon. With his family desperate to heal him, Ed and Lorraine Warren asked priests to perform an exorcism on the boy. Although the exorcism was a success, the demon apparently lodged itself in the body of a young man named Arne Cheyenne Johnson, who would later go on to kill his landlord. In Johnson's trial, the defense argued that he had murdered his landlord because of his demonic possession, leading to the trial being dubbed the Devil Made Me Do It case. What is connecting them to the rocking chair? Disturbingly, the original exorcism of David Glatzel took place in the room of the Glatzel's house where this chair used to sit. During the exorcism, the chair allegedly levitated and rocked, with one eyewitness even claiming that they had seen the devil himself sitting in it. The Warrens were sued by the Glatzels some years later after the Glatzels complained that Ed and Lorraine had manipulated them. The Glatzels believed that David was mentally ill and that the Warrens had exploited his condition. This has not been confirmed, however, and this theory was washed away in the sea of mystery that surrounds Ed and Lorraine Warren. However, according to many sources, the events that occurred in Zach Bagan's museum were very real. As they say, the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Suffice to say, that among the many theories regarding the paranormal, the devil isn't necessarily always the scariest thing out there. Where did lunar water come from? Our moon has a rather bizarre phenomenon we are still trying to puzzle our way through. There is lunar water on the moon, despite us not being able to observe a water cycle similar to ours on Earth. A recent study has reported clear evidence that there are water molecules on the surface of or held within the grains of the lunar soil. If we can research what kinds of water are available here and precisely where that water is, then we may be able to fathom out the seemingly magical water cycle of the moon. Another study with groundbreaking revelations found small areas of the moon that are within a permanent shadow. This creates a cold enough environment for ice to form. Additionally, the space of these areas covers 15,400 square miles according to National Geographic. Current guesses indicate that the water cycle on the moon is carried through hydrogen in solar wind reacting with oxygen on the surface. This is a stark contrast to our rain, rivers, seawater cycle here on Earth. Other suggestions have guessed that the lunar water travels, migrating to remain in a shadowed zone as opposed to one with sun. Exactly how this happens still requires plenty of further research. Jessica Sunshine, University of Maryland planetary scientist, says that these new findings suggest a more complex process than what we thought before. 
The practical application once we figure this out would be remarkable. This research has useful implications as to how humans may be able to travel, not only to the moon, but further beyond too. The next NASA mission, Artemis, aims to place the first woman and next man on the moon. If we can understand the moon's water cycle before then, then we may be able to convert the water into a resource for energy. One trial for the lunar water to withstand is the harsh climate of the moon, with a high of 120 degrees Celsius and a more than chilly low of minus 133 degrees Celsius. It wouldn't be improbable for the water to evaporate, especially without a thick atmosphere. But, luckily for us, even in the sun there are still traces of water, though these are faint. Based upon current observations, there appears to be 12 ounces of lunar water to 1 cubic meter, meaning the water, whilst existent, is very sparse. This is 100 times drier than the Sahara Desert. Whilst there is water present on the moon, we need to conduct more observations, more analysis, more research before we take action with this thrilling discovery. Once we know a little more about the intricate process, we may need to implement some man-made intervention for this water to be of use due to its limited supply. This research is being referred to by some as the slow revolution. Whilst new progress is being made and we are slowly beginning to make a clearer picture, but the tedious process could still take decades of more research. Researchers completing this project report that despite having a difficult job, the work is very rewarding and know that the findings will be worthwhile. Whilst there are so many unanswered questions out in the universe, some of the more interesting ones begin much closer to home. Between unanswered questions and thrilling new research, our moon has a lot of exciting news going on at the moment. Haunted Mirror up for auction There are three ways that you can get to know more about the captain of the Titanic, named Edward John Smith. Because he went down with the ship, you, unfortunately, cannot sit down and have a chat with him. However, if you were a time traveller, you could go back and meet him. Another way is by doing a classic internet search to learn more about his life. The last method is by glancing into his mirror. Before the captain set sail, he had left one mirror on his dressing table. Perhaps it was the last mirror he had ever looked into before he left the shores. 110 years later, this antique now is deemed to be possessed by his ghost and was recently up for auction. The first spirit encounter was when his maid took the mirror back home and claimed she could see his face appear annually when it came to the Titanic sinking anniversary. It was passed down in her family line until somehow ended up abandoned. Then, a man named David Smith found it and had it locked in a vault of his for over five years, accompanied by a small handwritten note about the mirror's ghostly past. Finally, the mirror left the vault and was put up for auction. It was a museum from Las Vegas that eventually won the bid, forking out over £2,800 for the rights to own it. Perhaps, if you are lucky, you might just be able to come across this mirror for yourself one day upon the next anniversary of the Titanic. As you gaze into the glass, do not expect to see your own reflection. You might just find yourself standing face to face with the ill-fated captain himself. The Holy Face of Genoa Throughout history there have been many relics and paintings that are claimed to have the accurate image of Christ's face. But historians and even the most religious people take these claims with a pinch of salt. However, there is one remarkable ancient relic that has been described as the oldest portrait of Christ. Most people believe it to be the most accurate and authentic portrait of Jesus Christ. Known as the Holy Face of Genoa, this portrait is today present in the Church of St. Bartholomew of the Armenians in the town of Genoa in Italy. There is a popular ancient legend about the creation of the Holy Face of Genoa. It is believed that King Abgar of Edessa in Armenia was sick with leprosy when he heard about the miraculous healing powers of Jesus. At that time, Jesus was in Palestine. Unable to travel himself, the king sent an artist named Ananias to meet Jesus and paint a portrait of his face. However, upon reaching Jerusalem, the artist failed at his attempts to portray Jesus accurately. 
This is when Jesus took the canvas and rested it on his face that was covered with sweat. As a result, an image of the face of Jesus was printed on the canvas. Ananias returned to Armenia with the image and touched the king with the canvas. The king was miraculously healed from leprosy. Since that day, the shroud has been worshipped as a sacred relic. The canvas with the portrait of Jesus has since been kept in a silver gilt frame that was made during the 14th century. Dead Children's Playground, Alabama's Maple Hill Cemetery Maple Hill Park in Huntsville, Alabama, a children's playground sits adjacent to Alabama's largest cemetery, Maple Hill Cemetery. Locally referred to as Dead Children's Playground, it's not surprising that the park is home to a host of supernatural encounters. Nocturnal visitors have reported the eerie, disembodied laughter of children. The frantic calls of mothers looking for their children and the squeak of swings caused by more than just the evening's breeze. Photographers have captured mysterious orb shapes playing on the playground's equipment, mysterious child-sized figures and disconcerting illuminations. It seems the children buried in the cemetery enjoy the site just as much as their living counterparts. Maple Hill is Alabama's oldest cemetery, having been officially founded in 1822, but reports suggest that the land was used as a burial ground for quite some time before that. The site originally encompassed only two acres of land, but now sprawls over 100 acres. It is the final resting place of over 80,000 people, including US senators and Confederate soldiers. Many believe the cemetery's playground is haunted by the spirits of hundreds of children who died during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. If a playground situated amongst gravestones wasn't eerie enough, the park's perimeter is demarcated by dramatic, rugged stone. Years before the construction of the playground in 1985, the area was used as a limestone quarry. After it was abandoned, thick woodland formed and would become the backdrop for some brutal and horrific crimes. In the 1960s, several children from the local area were reported missing. According to local urban legend, someone walking through what would become the playground site came across a child's skull. The abandoned quarry was searched to unearth the missing child's remains. The bodies of the children showed signs of malnourishment and healing wounds, suggesting the perpetrator tortured their victims over some time rather than committing the murders in a frenzied attack. The string of child abductions ended after the bodies were discovered, but the serial killer was never found. Many of the children's bodies recovered were given a proper burial in the adjacent cemetery. You might think that a playground tucked away in a cemetery with a dark and violent history would not be popular with its neighbours. But in 2007, when the city of Alabama attempted to remove the playground to make room for more burials, it caused outrage among local people. The park was instead refurbished with modern equipment and picnic tables, and remains a well-used public facility by both the living and the dead. What is the true size of a great white shark? Great white sharks have long been considered one of the most fearsome extant macro predators in the open ocean, both for their many rows of terrifying razor-sharp teeth and for their overbearing size and mass. However, while it's a universal certainty that they're larger than most other macro predatory fish, their exact size has long since been the topic of widespread debate and uncertainty for many scientists across the globe. The great white shark is one of many sea mammals in which sexual dimorphism is inherently present. In other words, the female great whites tend to be larger in size and mass than their male counterparts. At birth, grey whites are recorded as measuring up to 1.2 meters and grow 25 centimeters every year. The majority of verified great white shark sightings on record indicate that, on average, adult male great whites can measure between 3.4 and 4 meters and weigh between 522 and 771 kilograms. Meanwhile, female great whites measure between 4.6 to 4.9 meters and have an average mass of 680 to 1100 kilograms. Somewhat contradictory to this, there have been numerous sightings of larger female sharks over the years, some of them unverified while others were verified. According to J.E. Randall, the largest white shark reliably measured was found in Ledge Point, Western Australia, in 1987, and is said to have measured at least 6 metres. 
Around a decade later, in 1998, the Canadian Shark Research Centre captured and verified a female shark of a similar size off the coast of Alberta, Prince Edward Island, measuring 6.1 metres. Furthermore, a white shark captured off the coast of Malta in 1987 is said to have measured an estimated 7.13 metres by John Abela. Photographic evidence of the shark dubbed Malta was thoroughly examined and was found to confirm this estimation, even suggesting that it was larger than what it was first thought. This suggests that great whites can grow up to at least 7 metres, a vast jump from the previous known size of 4.9 to 6.1 metres. Alternatively, the largest unconfirmed sighting of the great white shark has to be the case of the shark that was found trapped in a herring weir in New Brunswick, Canada during the 1930s. Records from the time indicate that this shark appeared to measure at least 11.3 meters and weighed well over 3,000 kilograms. Some argue that these measurements were not obtained in a rigorous, scientifically valid manner, suggesting that they may not be accurate at all. Later studies of the shark in question found that it may have actually been a basking shark rather than a great white, a common misidentification due in part to their similar body shapes. Fundamentally, all that this data and anecdotal evidence can tell us is that there is no clear-cut, consistent information to say how large great white sharks can really grow. Recorded and verified great white shark sightings indicate that the limit is 6.1 meters, but unconfirmed accounts say that they can grow way beyond. The Disappearance of the Chicouf Serving as the largest French Navy cruiser submarine during World War II, the Chacouf was designed to be at sea for long periods away from military bases and facilities. Commissioned by the French Navy in 1934, it cruised distant waters for eight years before mysteriously vanishing sometime in the night on 18th of February 1941 in the Caribbean Sea. The Sirkouf was built to pursue and destroy enemy vessels, work with the Navy squadrons and connect to the French colonies. It had weapons similar to a naval warship, focusing on long-range firings and high speeds. It aimed to seek out enemies and engage in combat and had enough food and supplies for 90-day missions. It possessed torpedoes, cannons, a motorboat, a float plane and a large space for up to 40 prisoners. Despite its formidable design, it struggled a bit with firing weapons because of the time it needed to activate weapons, difficulty calculating the angle of its roll, and the inability to see at night. In 1940, the submarine was in overhaul in Brittany, France, when the Germans invaded. With only one working engine and a broken rudder, it swam across the channel and joined the British. They completed its refitting to return it to free France but tensions were high as both the British Royal Navy and the Free French Navy accused each other of spying for Vichy France. Nonetheless, the Surcouf returned to the French resistance and continued fighting against the Axis powers. It began its journey when it accompanied Free France convoys in 1941 to liberate French colonies, like the islands Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. In January 1942, the Chirkouf planned to travel to Sydney, Australia, through the Panama Canal and the Pacific. On the 2nd of February, it made its way down from Halifax, Virginia, to Bermuda. On the 12th of February, it set off for the Panama Canal. The Chirkouf vanished on the 18th of February, 130 kilometers north of Cristobal Colón, a port town in northern Panama on the Caribbean side, as it made its way to the Pacific Ocean. It is believed that the submarine collided with an American freighter, the Thompson Likes, coming from Guantanamo Bay. The freighter's captain and crew reported running down something partially submerged, scraping against it with their side and keel. Some even claimed that they heard voices out on the water, but the freighter did not stop to find out what it hit. Investigators are doubtful that this American freighter ran into the Chacouf as there are significant size discrepancies. The submarine was much too large to have only slightly damaged the ship. Even eyewitness account descriptions recounted a smaller sized submarine. The current belief is that it might have been sunk by friendly fire from a flying boat on patrol that same night. 
It was an exceptionally dark night, and they perhaps had trouble recognizing whether it was a German or Japanese submarine. Another theory is that their radio was broken, and the 6th Bombardment Group in Panama attacked it. The fate of the Shakuf remains a mystery to this day. No official dive or search of the sea has been conducted, so its location is still unknown. 130 sailors were on that submarine, both from the French and British Navy, and are considered lost at sea. Hidden Rooms in the Great Pyramid Almost 4,500 years ago, between 2,509 BC and 2,483 BC, the Pharaoh Khufu was ruler of ancient Egypt. During this time, Pharaoh Khufu ordered the creation of the Great Pyramid, a monumental display of power. Built completely for himself, the pyramid itself has more than a 13-acre base and originally had a 479-foot-tall peak. The construction of the Great Pyramid is astonishing. Over 2.3 million blocks of limestone were quarried, cut to specific measurements, and then placed into the formation we know today. The Great Pyramid is regarded as one of the wonders of the ancient world. In 2017, scientists studying the pyramid announced that they had found a previously unknown void inside of the pyramid that's estimated to be around 30 meters long. The last time any kind of big structure inside the pyramid was discovered was in the 1800s. This new void was found using a process called muon radiography. This method utilizes cosmic rays to locate voids or cavities inside of structures. This new discovery is being compared to the previously discovered Grand Gallery of the Pyramid. The Grand Gallery is a 150-foot-long corridor that goes directly to the burial room of Khufu, the pharaoh that commissioned this marvel of the ancient world. This corridor is also around 26 feet tall and sits below the newly discovered area. Still, it is completely unknown what or if anything lies within this area and what it was used for. It could be several smaller rooms or one large area we simply do not know. This discovery is still huge, it brings us closer to finally being able to understand and even just know the various intricacies of this truly astonishing structure. This discovery was made by the Scan Pyramids Project working with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities and is widely regarded as the most impressive achievement of the technique used to find it. We know this large void exists, but we really know nothing else about it. Hopefully, it will potentially validate any ideas of exploring the Great Pyramid further and hopefully understanding it better Maybe further exploration will uncover more secrets. Highgate Cemetery, London, UK Just the word cemetery is capable of sending chills down some people's spines. Generally speaking, humans tend to find things associated with loss of life rather creepy, and the story behind Highgate Cemetery is not likely to alter their impression. Highgate Cemetery is chilling enough in pictures, let alone in real life. Built in the 1830s, the cemetery is the burial place of 170,000 people. Amongst them are the singer George Michael, political philosopher Karl Marx, South African anti-apartheid campaigner Yusuf Dadu, and scientist Michael Faraday. The cemetery, situated in North London, covers some 37 acres. Its spectacular Gothic architecture made it a fashionable place to be buried in Victorian England. Coincidentally, the same era that ghost stories and gothic fiction began to rise in creativity and subsequently popularity. Works such as Bram Stoker's Dracula, Edgar Allan Poe's poem The Raven, Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, and Henry James's The Turn of the Screw were all published between 1837 and 1901 owing to the reinterpretation of horror in Victorian times. It wasn't until the 1970s, however, that the most famous haunting story arose out of Highgate. In the late 1960s, Highgate Cemetery fell victim to vandalism. In fact, the tomb of Karl Marx had survived two attempted explosive strikes. In 1968, a group of young occult enthusiasts began visiting the cemetery, following various reports of paranormal activity in the cemetery. This activity included sightings of the deceased rising from sealed graves, phantoms drifting around the cemetery, and even an attack on a teenager, leaving physical scars. 
In the same year the group visited, what was described as a desecration of one grave was discovered. It was not known whether the occult group had anything to do with this, but the scene discovered was horrendous nonetheless. According to reports in the London Evening News, an unknown person arranged flowers taken from graves in circular patterns with arrows of blooms pointing to a new grave, which was uncovered. A coffin was opened and the body inside was disturbed. But their most gruesome act was driving an iron stake in the form of a cross through the lid and into the chest of the corpse. In the years following the bizarre finding, bodies of deceased animals with slashed throats began to appear in the cemetery. And when a local newspaper published the story of a man named David Farrant in February 1970, the Highgate vampire myth was further fueled. David Farrant had reported seeing a grey figure wandering amongst the tombstones that he believed to be supernatural. Soon after, David Farrant entered into a bitter ghost-hunting dispute with self-proclaimed exorcist Sean Manchester. Sean Manchester declared the phantom a vampire and the pair set about hunting it down. David Farrant was later arrested and the ordeal ended in 1973 when Sean Manchester allegedly drove a stake through the beast's heart in the House of Dracula in Crouch End, London. The legend, however, lives on to this day. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos. Thank you.